The Tony Hawk skateboarding franchise, once the measuring stick for extreme sports games, but a franchise that gradually lost its profile and faded into nothingness. So what happened? How did a series that contains the second highest rated game of all time fall so far? Well, join me today as we take a look at the Tony Hawk skateboarding franchise and ask, what went wrong? To really examine how the series fell so far, we first need to take a look at how it got to that point in order to examine the context. Examine the rise to contextualize just how steep the fall was. The Tony Hawk skateboarding franchise is potentially the most well-known series of extreme sports games to ever exist. If you ask any gamer to name an extreme sports franchise, chances are 9 out of 10 people will name this one. It introduced a new generation to the concept of skateboarding, where they would immediately pick up the anomalous wooden board and realize just how difficult skateboarding actually is. But there's no doubt that the series would give people the wrong impression on just how difficult the sport is, given how great the games are. It was a series built upon fast-flowing, smooth arcade skateboarding action. Skateboarding as a sport lent itself to the video game medium because it was built upon freedom and flamboyance of technique. So the idea of kicking that up to 11 and giving you the ability to pull off a larger-than-life virtual tricks unlike anything possible in the real world? Well, it was a match made in heaven. Plus, skateboarding has always, or at least for most of its existence, had this counterculture element hard-coded into its DNA. A sport built around the idea of rejecting conformity and turning everyday architecture into your own personal playground. And while this may be slightly lost to history now, around this time, video games as a medium were also seen as counterculture because they had yet to penetrate into the mainstream. So they were seen as very juvenile to a mass audience. Something that kids did. Which only furthered that match made in heaven feel. There were a few skateboarding games before this, but nothing that left a lasting impression, but as it turns out, all they needed was the right game and the right name attached. Activision saw a potential growing niche and got Neversoft on board, no pun intended, and in September 1998, Activision put pen to paper for Tony Hawk to lend his name to the project. The result was 1999's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was a game that combined the anarchic feel of skateboarding, a punk aesthetic, and the world's most popular skateboarder at the height of his popularity, leading to instant success and with that, critical acclaim. The formula was simple, you're plonked into a level, you have several tasks to pull off around each level, go get him, tiger. The addition of the two minute timer was genius because it meant you were given ample time to pull off one or more tasks per run, but weren't given so much time that you could slack off, leading to a constantly fast, exciting pace. And the licensed soundtrack was just the cherry on top. Matter of fact, the soundtrack was considered so instantly iconic that Superman by Goldfinger has unofficially become the series' main theme. Although, personally, I prefer Blood Brothers from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, or indeed Ace of Spades from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Licensed soundtracks weren't overly common back then, so hearing real-life bands blasting in your ear while you're pulling off insane tricks was novel, and only continued to make this game all the more exciting. I don't think the game's aged that well, at least compared to the sequels. It's stiff, it's janky, it's imprecise, and at times hard to control. For example, if you wanted to do a flip trick into a grab, you needed to wait until the animation for the flip trick ended in order to hit the grab button, otherwise it won't register. It's also missing a lot of what a game like this needs in order to make the most out of the concept. Manuals, for example, are conspicuous by their absence, really limiting the ways you can string combos together. Plus, the generally small and or limited environments, only five tasks per level, and the soundtrack, while iconic being fairly small, let this game a feeling of being a proof of concept more than anything, at least in hindsight. Not to say it's a bad game, there's definitely still fun to be had, it's a lot better than I remembered it being from the last time I played it, and there's still a lot of things that it absolutely nails right out of the gate, despite being granted almost immediate obsolescence by its sequels. But whether it's your favorite or least favorite, there's no doubt in my mind that it was a landmark title in the history of the subgenre. Never before had it been done this well, and the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series started with a bang, selling millions, so a sequel was almost inevitable. And this is the game that most people associate most fondly with the series, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2.
On paper, the list of additions to this game really isn't that extensive. The only major new addition to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is the ability to do manuals, which itself is a groundbreaking feature for the series, allowing you the ease of which to string together combos which were impossible before. But to me, it's not about what this game adds, it's about what it improves. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 felt like the vision of the first game brought to fruition. The controls are perfectly tight and responsive, and as a result the gameplay is smoother and more satisfying to pull off. The difference is like night and day, and becomes clear the moment you play one after the other. Any jank that was there is now a thing of the past. The levels are bigger and more intricately laid out on average, with some of the fondest remembered levels in the history of the series, including New York, School 2, Venice Beach, and even Skater Heaven. They also started the trend of guest characters in these games, this time including none other than Spider-Man. Neversoft, of course, being the developers for the first 5th gen Spider-Man game. Then the soundtrack was greatly improved in my opinion, including such bands as Bad Religion, Papa Roach, Power Man 5000, and Rage Against the Machine. Even the lesser known songs are all bangers, such as May 16th by Lagwagon. It also introduces several customization elements that would be inseparable from the series going forward. Altering a skateboarder's moveset, create a skater, create a park, things that are almost so synonymous with the series it's weird to think there was a time where the Tony Hawk franchise existed without them. It was an improvement in near enough every single way possible over its predecessor. And where the previous game received critical acclaim, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 blew the first game out of the water when it comes to reception, receiving an average score of 98% from critics, making it to this day the second best received game in history with only Ocarina of Time ahead of it. There's no caveat here, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 continues to be great to this day, fully deserving of its praise. Graphics aside, it holds up perfectly, it's just as fun now as it was back then. I'd say this is generally considered the most iconic game in the series. The one that most people think of when they think of the series. Probably why it's been remade not once, not twice, but thrice. Maybe it's because it's the one most people have played, maybe it's the one most people enjoy the most, maybe it's nostalgia, maybe it's Maybelline. It doesn't make it any less deserving, and with that lightning in a bottle success, of course more was sure to come, this time in the form of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Would this be where luck runs out, or would this be the continuation of the hot streak? Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 is generally considered the height of the franchise, but to me, that goes to this game, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Of course, because it came out in 2001, it ended up being cross-gen, so the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube versions were made by the main Neversoft team, while other versions were handed off to studios like Shabba Games or Vicarious Visions. The funny thing was, to my knowledge, every single version received critical acclaim, with the possible exception of the Game Boy Color version, but I can't seem to find much info on that game at all. And I've played the last gen and next gen versions, and despite being quite different to accommodate the different hardware, they're both still absolutely excellent. The purpose of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 was to more or less up the ante, especially in the next gen version. They already perfected the controls, now it was just about refining the whole experience. The most major new addition to the moment to moment gameplay is the ability to revert which when timed right upon landing allows you to string half-pipe combos together, where that was previously impossible in most situations. To me, this was the final piece of the puzzle in the gameplay design that eliminated all limitations from the engine. Now that you could theoretically string combos together in any situation, it meant that your ability to pull off insane tricks was simply down to your own skill level, and that to me is why I think Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 is the absolute peak of the series because it takes an already perfected control scheme and gameplay formula and naturally evolves it to its logical conclusion while also including a set of levels that are arguably as good if not better than the previous games. Foundry, Tokyo, Rio de Janeiro, Airport, Los Angeles, all A-tier levels, with several versions also having exclusive levels. My favorite being the cruise ship. As a matter of fact, on a personal note, I actually think the levels are what puts this game over the edge for me as my favorite in the series. Because I don't think there was a weak level in the lot. Where previously you had incredibly iconic levels, you also had more than a few duds as well. Philadelphia springs to mind immediately. Which is in keeping in line with real life because Philadelphia is awful. The soundtrack as well is my favorite and included such bands as Red Hot Chili Peppers, AFI, Zebrahead, Body Jar, The Ramones, and a personal highlight, Motorhead. 
But you can kind of see that this is where the issues began, because after three games they'd made several iconic environments and pretty much every necessary feature you really needed was already added. There were still plenty of things you could add to the formula, but it would inevitably just end up adding bloat to the formula, of which there was still very little. Plus, while the game was critically acclaimed and sold well, there's a sense that Pro Skater 3 wasn't as instantly iconic as 2. So despite critical acclaim, the public perception of the series had seemingly already peaked. To this day, Pro Skater 3 is overshadowed by its older brother, and I guess older brothers. At this point, they probably felt the series as it was had pretty much ran its course. They'd done everything they could do under the limitations of the current gameplay style with the two minute timer, and they needed to evolve it in order for the series to continue to thrive. And that resulted in the next game in the series, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. Of all the games under the Pro Skater banner, this is one that tends to get lost in the shuffle. I don't hear many people talking about 3, but in the grand scheme of the discourse for the series over the years, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 might as well not even exist, which is a shame because it's still a really solid game. It's just as smooth to control and just as flowing as the games that preceded it, and pulling off sick tricks still has the exact same appeal. However, there's one notable change in this game that would alter the direction of the series going forward forever. They completely gutted the two minute timer concept. Now instead of being given a set amount of time and every task for the level up front, each task is its own individual challenge that you have to activate. This doesn't ruin the concept by any means, but it does mean that in attempting to give you more sandbox freedom, they made the concept less interesting. Because with every task being its own individual challenge, you don't have the ability to stack challenges and accomplish multiple tasks at once, which is one of the more satisfying things to do in the previous games. Matter of fact, one of my personal favorite accomplishments in gaming was when I did every single task in Foundry from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 in a single two minute run. I took a picture of it as proof, but unfortunately that proof was on a phone that was destroyed while I was snowboarding back in 2014. True story. So I can't prove this, but I can definitely say that this is one of the main appeals of the first three games. So their solution for freshening up the formula was to add extra steps between you and the stuff you came here for. Trading some tightness of design for more freedom, and I don't think the game really benefited. In fact, I think it was kind of the opposite. As for the additional tricks, well, as I said would happen, all it ended up doing was adding extra fat to the tight as hell existing control scheme and feature set. Of course, new games need new features. This is fact. I would never ask them to just re-release Pro Skater 3 over and over. Although now they're just releasing Pro Skater 2 over and over, but I digress. But if you were to ever identify the specific time in which the diminishing return started, this is it. Things like spine transfers further allow you to do continuous combos by patching up a few remaining blind spots in your ability to string combos together, but these are such situational maneuvers that, even though they patch up blind spots, the blind spots are so small that you wouldn't even notice them. Multi-flips were a fun addition as well, even if it's just a means to do functionally the same thing as you were already able to do, just in a slightly different way. But things like power slides and the different manual slash lip slash grind extensions, these are things that to me come across like interruptions to the standard combos rather than extensions to them, ironically. And it's not to say this game doesn't have fun ideas. I like the pro challenges where you can recreate iconic moments in the history of each individual pro skater's, you know, history. And the combo challenges are fun, having to collect the combo letters in a single sequence of tricks, but still, I find that fourth entries in major franchises tend to see major drop-offs in quality because it's usually when the idea bucket runs dry and they end up at best in a holding pattern, and that's certainly true here. It comes across as largely more of the same, with some new ideas that range from D decent to really questionable. It still has some really imaginative levels, fun challenges, and another A-tier soundtrack, and how can I possibly hate a game that not only includes Iron Maiden on the soundtrack, but includes Eddie the Head as a playable character. This wasn't the killing blow for the series by any means, but for me, it's the iceberg that put a slice in the hole that would eventually sink this Titanic because it had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the series had already peaked and recapturing the spark was going to be difficult, which leads us to the next game, Tony Hawk's Underground.
When the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater franchise started, it was in the late 90s, back during the dying days of the pure arcade experience. Games built around pure gameplay and little to no story. But by 2003, that was largely a thing of the past as AAA gaming moved more towards integration of narrative focus being a requirement. No exceptions. Neversoft caught wind of this and thought the next logical step for their series would be to add a proper story much in the same way you would add gravy to ice cream. Okay, I jest. I don't want to speak ill of Tony Hawk's Underground, or as it's colloquially known, Thug, because it's a really solid game. Probably my fourth favorite entry in the entire series. Although to say it's merely my fourth favorite is probably sacrilege, because outside of the original two, this is definitely one of the most well-known and fondly remembered games in the series. The discourse surrounding this game came across to me like 3 and especially 4 might as well not even exist, it might as well have just gone from 2 to Thug. I theorized that while it may have only been something like a 4 year gap between the first game in the series and this one, I feel like there was a significant portion of people that lost interest in the series and moved on, but Underground, because it was a rebranding of sorts, ended up being the entry point for a new generation of kids who had just entered the gaming landscape with the PS2. I have no basis for this speculation other than my own observations growing up, because I knew several people in elementary school who loved Underground but never talked about the rest of the series. But that's just my anecdotal theory. Now of course this game adds a few new features once again, and slowly these additions are becoming more and more token and superfluous. Wall plants and acid drops are probably the two really useful features, and it also broke new ground by allowing you to get off your skateboard, which added a new dimension to the gameplay in that it allowed you more control over the starting and stopping of your trick sequences, or lines as they're referred to. For the record though, it controlled like freshly spanked buttock, and the game was clearly not built for this whatsoever. So the odd platforming sequence was about as agonizing as it gets. They also give you side modes with other vehicles to play around with, but if I'm being honest, they all feel completely slapdash. Then there's the matter of skill point upgrades now being based on relevant challenges, which was kind of obnoxious. You get skill point upgrades once you've proven you don't need them, but I guess that's just a get good complaint. Oh yeah, there's also the create a trick which I liked. You know, being able to essentially defy gravity. But still, if a major new addition to your skateboarding game is the ability to not skateboard, you might be running out of steam. You might not be out of steam, but definitely not where you once were. No, the most notable addition was as I said a full linear story that takes you from the slums of New Jersey all the way to the highest peaks of the skateboarding world. If they were going to eliminate the 2 minute timer and build the levels around more individual tasks, integrating a linear story mode into that makes perfect sense, as the linear sequence of tasks can play into the story. Incidentally, since the main character is your custom character obliging you to make your own creation, I decided to make the most ridiculous looking person I could possibly make. And a friend later pointed out that he has the same color scheme as Zavok, so I decided that he's the deadbeat cousin of Zavok, Havok. The story is okay, primarily built around your character who wants to become a professional skateboarder through honesty and hard work. Then your best friend and recurring series douchebag Eric Sparrow is willing to scheme and claw his way to the top, leading to several backhanded dealings and an eventual betrayal. Then your character falls from grace and has to pull themselves back up. As far as stories about people riding around on pieces of wood go, this is a pretty compelling personal journey. You know, I have a friend who got married in this exact spot. I'm not even kidding. It's kind of uncanny. Despite the fact that this game is a quality time, hindsight shows how concerning it is that in only two games, the series has become nearly unrecognizable from what it was. I'm all for a series shaking things up when the formula gets stale, but it just goes to show how quickly the series lost its unique identity in order to keep up with the modern industry and, more to the point, itself. But is it wrong to sacrifice a unique identity if it means success on the level of Tony Hawk's Underground? Absolutely not. Reflected in the game's sales, getting a pretty significant bump. So of course, they ended up pulling the Modern Warfare Gambit and made Tony Hawk 6 Underground 2. And this is where things take a turn for me. It's no secret that the gameplay systems had been perfected for multiple games at this point, but at the very least you could rely on some new features. Underground 2 was when I felt the series was really starting to stagnate, as there was not a single important addition to the core gameplay in my opinion. Every single addition is now completely token and completely gimmicky. Not a spins, graffiti, freakouts, focus mode, none of this meaningfully expands the core gameplay. 
They're all situational and don't really fit into the average combo very smoothly at all. They also introduced a system wherein each level in the story has different tasks that can be performed by one of the four main playable characters in the level. And you need to earn a certain amount of points per level to move on to the next. Whatever tasks you choose is up to you. The four players in each level consists of, first of all, your custom character, whom this time I realized halfway through character creation was looking like the MCU's Nebula, so I decided that she was a distant cousin of Nebula named Ebola. Then you have a skateboarding pro, Rodney Mullen for the win, a guest character, and a secret character. The different characters leads to having different wacky vehicles including a Segway, a wheelchair, and a go-kart, none of which feel particularly great to control, nor do they have a wide range of tricks. Then there's the story which is a downgrade from last time, depicting your character being roped into a competition between Team Tony Hawk and Team Bam Margera called the World Destruction Tour, where each team competes to do crazier, more destructive stunts and the losing team has to pay for everything. There's some interesting things here, like a subplot with a producer and sub-villain named Nigel Beaverhausen wanting to capture the tour on film. It's humorous but unremarkable. Now, before I conclude with this game, I do need to bring this up, because I know people are going to bring this up, and I couldn't think of any way to smoothly integrate it into the actual script. This game does famously have a very special guest character. I guess that makes Underground 2 a perfect 10. In all seriousness, Tony Hawk's Underground 2 was a bit of a damning display for the series, because to me at least, it's the game that proves that it's entirely possible for a game in this series to be completely forgettable. When the most major new addition to the game is including a classic mode to bring back the very thing you abandoned two games ago, you really get the sense that the series is starting to struggle to keep its head above the water. So after a bit of goodwill, they were starting to flounder again, meaning they needed to really pull out all the stops for the next game, and quite frankly, that's exactly what they did. Tony Hawk's American Wasteland is probably my third favorite game in the series. That's mostly just because they went completely all out with the formula. If you're going to expand on the formula that they had in the early days of the series, you might as well go completely balls out. Anything that had yet to be added has now been added, including multipliers to pretty much every single trick, as well as several non-skateboarding based additions such as parkour gameplay and a whole BMX mode. That's not even taking into account the feature that this game was near enough sold on. They promised a seamless open world where you can go from place to place and never have to sit back and let the game take a breath. Granted, the compromise was having these long corridors between areas that worked functionally the same as loading screens, and if you moved too quickly the game had to load anyway. Though that was mostly on the PS2 port. You'd think that they could just make you spontaneously bail like they did in the first Jack and Daxter game to disguise loading, but it's a noble idea nonetheless, and honestly, yeah, I played this game and I really did feel like it was a proper skateboarding sandbox, possibly the first of its kind. It's very much a sandbox of its day, but that doesn't subtract from the quality any, other than the fact that the entire main game takes place pretty much in various parts of Los Angeles, which makes the scenery a bit repetitive, but it's a worthy compromise, although they do close off the critical path in order to make you grind for various things, which does subtract from the quality somewhat, but that's besides the point. Then the story was the best they'd ever done. You start off by selecting one of five custom skaters. Yo, is that f can Chris Chan? I guess I know who I'm choosing. Ah, uh, they force you to customize them, that's lame. This game stars your custom character moving to LA to make it big skateboarding after thoroughly failing in every other walk of life, but things go awry. It's essentially based around trying to save this seemingly nondescript skate ranch, which is a fictional historical piece of skateboarding Americana that's discovered to contain a fictional historical skate spot called Green Pipes Point. And after it's dug up, the owner of the land then wants to sell the ranch, which threatens history. So you need to find a way to buy the ranch and save the wasteland. This is about as complex and involved as you can get for a story about skateboarding, and that's not an insult. It's pretty compelling, and will probably hit very close to home to anybody who's ever been immersed in the skateboarding lifestyle themselves. I remember when I was a skateboarder in high school, I remember being absolutely heartbroken when I watched the Carlsbad Grass Gap, which actually made an appearance in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, get torn down. Because apparently they wanted to build a parking lot there, or something. This is not an uncommon occurrence through the ages. 
Skateboarding is still seen as an underground thing, and so the mainstream generally doesn't have respect for skateboarding or its history. But don't think just because this is a journey about preserving history that they can't have fun with it. I didn't really notice this before, but it was pointed out to me just how wacky this game is, and thinking about it, yeah, it really is. This series just kind of went eight ways wacky and raunchy at some point. I can't quite pinpoint where. I'm not gonna say it jumps the shark necessarily, even though you literally jump a shark at one point, but it definitely took a turn. But I can appreciate the audaciously juvenile and childish sense of humor. It's almost cute for how tryhard it gets at times. I also appreciate the pop culture references. This game references such movies as Fight Club and even Falling Down. <laughs> Now that's epic. The story was good, and they even still have a classic mode if you feel like it. Tony Hawk's American Wasteland is a game that can be best described as completely and utterly balls to the wall, and it managed to hotshot its way into my top three. But hotshotting is the operative phrase there. If you're not familiar, hotshotting is a phrase primarily used in professional wrestling that refers to when you go completely and utterly all out in order to generate a small-term uptick in business that should hopefully translate to longer-term success. American Wasteland represented yet another point of no return for the series because it went so over the top with its additions and its overall presentation that it kind of left the series nowhere to go, but go somewhere it did, with the eighth game in the series, Tony Hawk's Project 8. <laughs> This is the first game since Pro Skater 3 to be properly cross-gen, with different generations getting somewhat different games. But neither version really lit the world on fire. In the next-gen editions in this game, they made the seamless open world even more seamless, giving you the ability to go from place to place and find individual areas the size of individual levels from the early games. And of course, there were a few major changes made. Some good, some bad. The first change is due to them moving into HD. The graphics were shinier, but it meant that the character creation suite had been gutted, allowing for very few customization options. So I couldn't make a joke character like I previously did. The second major change was the different levels of completion. Each task has three separate levels of completion, depending on how good you do, and that will determine how many spots you move up in the ranking per task. The third was the nail the trick feature, which allowed you to go into slow motion and manipulate the board to make it do all the flip de doos you want in real time. Which played into the fourth major addition, Ragdoll Physics, which further allowed you to do bailing minigames, which was similar to the Hall of Meat mode in the EA Skate games. It's nice that they decided to join us in the 21st century, but it's also worth noting that Thrasher Skate and Destroy, which came out the same year as the first Tony Hawk game, had Ragdoll Physics. So it's not exactly breaking new ground. Project 8 does bring a significantly different feel to the series, particularly in how your skater feels. Whether that's because of the physics or other reasons, everything just feels a lot heavier, and as such it takes some getting used to. As for the story, it's based around Tony Hawk creating a team called Project 8, which is, as it sounds, a team of the eight best undiscovered skateboarders in the area. You start off in the 200th position and have to work your way up all the way to the top eight. By this point, it became completely undeniable that the series was just treading water and the shine had long since left the apple. They used up all the potential new ideas and what was left over comes across as just shuffling around the pieces that they already had or shoehorning features for the sake of justifying a sequel, rather than letting the new features naturally present themselves. It's a shame because this is definitely not a bad game whatsoever. I personally found myself really getting into it, if nothing else because it had a different feel to the games that came before it, which for all their good and bad started to blur together somewhat. But we're not necessarily talking about my opinion here, this is all about public perception and despite being on the new hardware, despite all the changes, despite positive critical reception, despite everything, Project 8 really didn't do anything to inject life into this waning franchise as reflected in the sales figures. There wasn't much gas left in the tank, and so whatever gas was left over was used on the final yearly release. There is now only one more stop on this road. Tony Hawk's Proving Ground. Tony Hawk's Proving Ground is the game of all time. It attempted to have some ideas and additions. Thankfully, they brought back a lot of the customization options, but still didn't have quite as many as they used to. But at least I got to make another ridiculous character. I call him John Diss. They also split the career path into three separate paths. Hardcore, Rigor, and Career. 
Hardcore is the masochistic style of skateboarding where you put your body on the line and disregard all the rules. Rigor is for the people who want to create their own custom spots to skate, and career is for the people who want to skateboard for the money and the fame, aka the sensible path. And the path you take determines the story, but it's nothing to write home about. They're mostly just three generic plot lines that are built around whatever specific path you choose. Although it was humorous to see baby Nigel Houston. As for the gameplay, it doesn't really bring much new to the table other than a new HUD and a new camera angle. The content is pretty well all integrated into the main story mode, including Create a Park, which is no longer its own mode, but rather part of the rigor path which you can use to customize the map to your heart's content. Which rather misses the point if you ask me, because part of the fun was creating the ultimate skate park in a sandbox setting, not rearranging the pieces that were already there. They also expanded the nail the trick aspect, including nail the manual and the grab. Elsewise than that, I can't think of anything notable that this game does that the earlier games didn't. More than ever, it just seems like it's less of a step forward and more of a step to the side. Although they took away features between American Wasteland and Project 8 that still haven't been added in, so this game is a step to the side when it comes to Project 8, but not the rest of the series. The only thing Proving Ground proved was just how far the series had fallen, and you can definitely see general interest falling from game to game. VG Charts isn't the most accurate thing in the world, but it does at least give you an idea of sales figures to go off of, and game over game, there was an exponential decline over time. The PS2 version of Tony Hawk's American Wasteland sold roughly on par with the combined sales of the PS2, PS3, and Xbox 360 versions of Proving Ground. But then, if you combine the sales of the GameCube, Xbox, and PS2 release of American Wasteland, it sold roughly a million units less than just the PS2 version of Tony Hawk's Underground, so it's very easy to track the diminishing returns here. Dwindling public interest and gradually declining critical scores led this to be the final main entry in the series, and the last game in the series made by Neversoft, who left without their meal ticket would tread water for a few more years before officially going out of business in 2013. But even after Proving Ground in 2007 proved to be the last main entry in the series for a time, Activision wasn't quite done beating this dead horse. You can tell that despite the main series petering out, they were still desperate to keep this thing alive, because that was when they went the spin-off route, with the likes of the thoroughly mediocre racing game Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam in 2006, or the critically panned Tony Hawk's Motion in 2008. It felt like they were desperately flailing around trying to recapture the spirit of the Tony Hawk franchise somehow in some way, but ended up with disappointment after disappointment. Which led to the absolute final nail in the coffin for the series. Now, those of you who were around during the height of the Xbox Kinect will remember how critically panned all those games were, because motion control was unreliable at the best of times even with a controller, let alone without. Well, before the Kinect, you had the one-two punch of Tony Hawk Ride and Tony Hawk Shred, which both came with a skateboard peripheral, which was meant to simulate the act of skateboarding through motion control. Suffice it to say, it barely worked. It's f***ing hard to control. Like, I can't control my... I, can, I can't control my own body. Like, this is, this is ridiculous. It was a risky attempt at capturing the novelty crowd, which failed to pay off to the same degree as other gimmick games and other gimmick consoles at the time. Whether that be down to the games being critically panned, the bundle being extremely expensive and exclusionary given the fact that you're buying a giant peripheral for the sake of one game, the fact that the game barely worked, or because the EA Skate franchise was busy reinvigorating the extreme sports genre by offering a more mature grounded alternative built around realistic skateboarding physics, whatever the case, this was the franchise's last stand, the hill that it died on. This was the end of the Tony Hawk skateboarding franchise as we knew it, going out in a fiery blaze of shame and failure. And since then, the series has been largely relegated to the garbage bin of history and or nostalgia. Of course, we had Skate Jam and Pro Skater 5, but those barely count because the former is a shovelware iOS game that lost the Tony Hawk branding later on, and the latter was a quickly hacked together piece of crap made literally just to keep the license, popularly considered one of the worst games of the generation, if not ever. Other than that, the Tony Hawk skateboarding franchise exists as a means to remake the ones that everyone is still sure are good. We've had two separate remakes of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, one in 2012 and one in 2020. And that's where we sit with the franchise at time of writing. Now, I know that appeared to be a long road to nothing, but I believe that to identify what happened, you need to trace the progression of the series from the beginning. And now that that's all been said and done, now that we've traced the lineage of the series from day one, the million dollar question is, what the hell happened? 
Well, I think it's quite obvious what the problem was. I think the problem comes from the fact that the games never stopped being quote-unquote good, but as I alluded to earlier, it was always the exact same good, because the core of the experience was largely unchanged from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 onward. And after that, they just kept tweaking things and adding extra bits on top of it. Those extra bits started off as necessary additions, but as you started to run out of necessary additions that were added to expand the concept, you'd eventually start adding superfluous additions that existed for the sake of having new features in order to justify a sequel, rather than just being a natural addition. That's certainly what happened. It's the type of diminishing returns that the series managed to skirt around for a while, but it eventually caught up to them because there's only so many things you can do on a skateboard. It's an inflexibility that more gamey games can get around. Mario, for example, is a franchise that's been going forever and something that theoretically has infinite shelf life because the concept is versatile enough that we probably still haven't even scratched the surface on the full extent of what the series can do. Even something like Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed, where they have near enough yearly releases, that's a case where the core gameplay is as developed as it ever reasonably could be, but they always base it around different protagonists and or different time periods, giving the concept some level of versatility. At least enough so that a general audience is willing to fork out 60 70 or $80 for the new entry every year. Some concepts have an extremely limited shelf life because you can only do so much within certain gameplay formulas. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Beyond had a lot of versatility in its execution because skateboarding in itself is a very versatile sport with a lot of different styles and tricks you can do. But here's some food for thought. How often are new skateboarding tricks invented these days? The answer is not very often because if there's a unique way to flip a piece of wood with your feet, chances are it's already been done. You're never gonna get another Rodney Mullen who invents new tricks with the same frequency that he changed his socks. Although I've heard Rodney Mullen is a bit weird, so it's probably less than it should. So while skateboarding games are a versatile concept, it's only as versatile as the sport itself. But the whole skateboarding thing is also further limiting because unlike, for example, God of War, you can't exactly shake up the gameplay and do something entirely new if the formula starts to wear thin. Because skateboarding is skateboarding, so the entire concept is inherently limited both in adding or changing gameplay. They tried to keep it fresh by adding narrative elements, but that's also limited by the subject matter because there aren't that many stories you can tell that require a person riding around on a piece of wood. You can tell the story about them making it big and not much else. The franchise was always going to be slightly pigeonholed because there was only so much you could change about it before it ceased to be the same franchise. Even just eliminating the two-minute timer was an almost identity-destroying alteration. So they were always going to have issues unless they went absolutely nuts with it and went all in on the absurdity. But would a general audience be okay with a game where Tony Hawk has a skateboarding competition on the moon and shoots lasers out of his cyberboard? Doubtful. I'm sure there are some people who would say they would like that, but it's kind of like those animated Sonic parodies where they make him all sweary and vulgar and whatnot. Yeah, it's funny and it works as a short YouTube parody, but in an official release, it would be laughable as hell. Besides, at what point does it stop being a game about skateboarding? Eventually, they were going to hit a wall of diminishing returns on gameplay mechanics, and the games never stopped being good, but if you play the same game over and over, it's going to get tiresome. If you only ever played sparse amounts of these games, then each individual entry would be awesome, but loyal fans are eventually going to get tired of it, and the people who weren't playing enough of the franchise to get tired of it probably weren't buying entries in the series consistently enough to keep it afloat. Or maybe they weren't attracting enough fans consistently to replace the ones that checked out of the series. I'd say everyone who followed this series at its peak had a jumping in point and a jumping off point. The probability of someone being there from start to finish isn't impossible, but it's probably a small minority. The majority of people jumped in when the series was brand new based off the hype, name brand recognition, word of mouth, and overall quality, but eventually everyone is bound to get tired of the same thing being re-released over and over, so it's a natural deflation of popularity, especially as the series itself started to no longer have the freshness of a brand new franchise. There were definitely still people jumping in and out even in the later stages of the franchise. I'm sure there are plenty of people who were introduced with Project 8, and we'll say that Project 8 is the best in the series. But those people were in a minority to the massive influx and eventual exodus of the early series. They simply couldn't sustain the level of ungodly hype long term no matter how many gimmicks they tried to introduce. 
Okay, so the series is versatile, but not infinitely versatile. But then why couldn't we have just gotten away with yearly releases in the same way that other sports franchises get away with it? Changing very little per entry, getting by purely on the idea of being the next big entry in this long-running franchise. Well, this is where I have to get a little bit anecdotal. Based on my observations, skateboarding as a sport doesn't have the same following that could support a franchise like that. I was a skateboarder for five years. From what I saw, skateboarding was a niche of a sport, and even those who skateboarded on average didn't have the same fiery passion for the sport or their favorite pro skaters that a football fan might have for their team, a player, or the sport as a whole. That's just one example. I don't know the psychology behind it, but skateboarding doesn't attract the same blind loyalty that a lot of other sports do. And in addition, how many people watch football that don't play themselves? A lot. But we don't see many people who are interested in skateboarding that don't do it themselves. On top of that, by my observations, most skateboarders are kids, teenagers, and young adults. You don't get so many people skateboarding into their 30s and 40s. It's not unheard of, but it's rarely something I ever saw. So that means the primary demographics are the people with the least amount of money, meaning you won't get so many day one sales off a core audience. So between the number of people interested, specifically to what degree they're interested, and demographics, it's hard to get people to buy skateboarding games off the back of them simply being skateboarding games in the same way you can get people to buy other sports games off the back of them simply being sports games for that sport. But because skateboarding is more flamboyant and has a lot of variety in the tricks you can do, it lends itself to being sold off the back of being a fun game. As such, it appeals to a more general gaming audience in theory, but the average game playing audience also isn't as loyal as a football fan or a basketball fan. But while they might not be loyal to the sport of skateboarding itself, they might be franchise loyal, but you also have to take into account that it doesn't have as much personality as other franchises that gamers are loyal to. So there's not as much to latch onto, meaning they're more likely to drop this franchise compared to something like Legend of Zelda, for example, where there's character and lore and interesting world, etc, etc, etc. So you need to keep things fresh gameplay-wise in order to have the general gaming audience keep coming back, because to that audience, that's largely the appeal of this franchise franchise, and so when the series was new and the ideas were flowing, the series prospered. But as soon as they ran out of new and meaningful additions to add, the series was on borrowed time because it was only a matter of time before the general gaming audience realized that these games were all the same and stopped buying them. The audience was going to get burnt out sooner or later, and the series was at increased risk as it aged because of the 20-year nostalgia cycle. By 2007, the series was too old to be fresh, but too new to be nostalgic. So suddenly, the entire franchise found itself as an old irrelevant dog competing with a new generation. Proving Ground proved itself to be the burnout point, and the desperate attempts to re-grab the spotlight did nothing but seal the franchise's demise. And after the death of the Tony Hawk skateboarding franchise, it wasn't long before we found ourselves in a skateboarding game drought. Following the release of Skate 3 in 2010, it was slim pickings for a number of years, with the exception of Pro Skater 5, but as I said, I don't count that one. But we've had a bit of a renaissance in recent years of both realistic and arcadey skateboarding games. Things like Project Session in the former category and Skatebird in the latter category, which I think really does go to show just how much better the gaming industry is right now than even a few years ago. AAA is more diverse than it was a few years ago, and even if AAA isn't doing what you want it to, there's still thousands upon thousands of independent developers. So whatever niche you're out to fill, you're almost guaranteed to have something filling it. Tony Hawk these days exists as a beacon of nostalgia, both in real life and in video game form. Wadunk. Which, as far as the video games, is less than what it has potential to be, so I would like to see them try their hand at a new Tony Hawk game for a new generation. But given how much of the series we've seen, we've probably seen it at its best and its worst already. But as much as other franchises have been filling those gaps, I still would like to see them at least make an attempt at a proper comeback. Only time will tell if we get that. So that's it for me today. If you like what I do here and want to support the channel financially, please consider pledging to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards, like early access, Discord benefits, and exclusive content like these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to FarmCat84, Ga004, Raf, Deep Betch, Joseph Rosas, Brooklyn, and Nicholas Pino for going above and beyond. Then you can also support the channel by liking this video, leaving a comment telling me what you think, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. Seriously, it helps the channel more than you know, and it's free. Elsewise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Peace!